So welcome to lecture number 25. And um, what we did last time was to, to uh, discuss a bit about Precambrian geology. And uh, if you remember, I introduced you to interesting things like uh, the oldest minerals that we have on Earth, the oldest rocks, the acastagnises. And uh, we discussed about, uh, a bit about the cratons. And we saw what the main geological features of the Archean and of the Proterozoic are. And I was hinting towards the idea that uh, the interpretation of the processes that led to the formation of the crust, of the continental crust in the Archean, um, is subjected to a controversy. Uh, sometimes the controversy extends over the Proterozoic time, but here we have some more evidence for uh, um, aspects that are more familiar to, to us from the Phanerozoic eon. Uh, and I'm talking here about elements of um, indicative of plate tectonics. Anyway, uh, as I was showing you in terms of the models of the evolution of uh, the crustal geotherms, so the distribution of temperature with depth, and uh, the actual uh, rate of growth of the, uh, of the continents. All this indicate that we are not looking necessarily at, um, at something that was constant all the, all the time the same. We, we, uh, we have to think that the tectonic process, the dynamics of the earth reflect the way uh, the earth loses heat and the production of heat and the rate of loss have been changing uh, over the geologic time. So this in itself is an indicator that uh, what we see today is not necessarily what was in the past or not in the same manner. So we are going to launch into the controversy and uh, we are going to discuss a, a bit about this controversy, state what it is, and then I'll show you the two opposing views, uniformitarian and non-uniformitarian. So, as I just mentioned, the controversy relates to the pause and the moment in the history of our planet when plate tectonics began. And currently, the problem, no matter what you read in terms of, uh, you'll see statements that seem very certain, that are like, oh, it is what, like this. <laughs> um, no matter uh, when you read these statements, uh, you have to be aware that this is not a settled issue. Okay, so what happens is that some authors propose that plate tectonics operated since early Archean times. I, remi I remind you that the Archean started four billion years ago. And this is the un uniformitarian view, as, as opposed to the school that says that actually the beginning of this mechanism of he, uh, losing heat started much later. And this is the non-uniformitarian view. Now, uniformitarian comes from the principle uh, of, uh, of uniformity, if you want, you, uh, uniformitarianism. Yeah? So if you look um, I, I look here uh, on my other screen and uh, you'll, you'll see something like uniformitarianism, doctrine of uniformity, uniformitarian principle. Maybe you learned uh, in Geosciencias, I haven't taught the Heo is a course of Geosciencias, so I don't know exactly yet the details of what's in, or maybe you learned with Natalia in the general geology, or maybe not. Or maybe you learned with Leslie in paleontology. But coming back to the question that David asked me last time, yeah, with the division of the Phanerozoic in many time intervals and linked to the evolution, uh, the appearance of different branches in the tree of life. Um, this first geologist, like James Hutton and Charles Lee, James Hutton in the 18th century. When they looked at the, at the processes they were witnessing, and they, you can imagine, as I was saying, they were very interested initially in the sedimentary rocks. 
And they realized that you could make this relationship between, okay, we see a sedimentary rock and we can infer that what we see today that happens in a sedimentary basin, yeah, you have sediment being brought into the sedimentary basin, being deposited in horizontal layers and so on. So this is a process that we realize we, we uh, observe today. And then we realize, okay, this was the process that led to the formation of these sedimentary layers in the geologic past that we saw. So it was kind of a logical thing to, uh, to think, okay, uh, the processes have been the same in the past. And that's why the famous say, the present is the key to the past. So to understand the past, we have to look at what we witness in the present and then we understand what happened in the past. So you can imagine that there is truth to this, but the question is to what extent? Yeah, and this, I come back to what I, to, to the ending of my class last time, to what extent? Because some important aspects have been changing. So there are people who apply this principle in a very, rigid manner and they say well this is what we see today that's been all the history of the planet and there are people who are uh, saying well not really okay so let's look a bit at this controversy so i'll start with something that is really startling you see we are looking at a very solid very famous very high quality journal called precambrian research people who are specialists in the Precambrian, they publish in this journal. And if you look at this volume 91 in August, 1998, the same volume, the same issue had these two papers published one after the other. One was by Martin David, you see from South Africa, called On Archean Granites, Greenstones, Cratons and Tectonics. Does the evidence demand a verdict? And here is a, a, a quote, which I would say it's encapsulating what he's saying in this paper. He's saying the verdict is that there is a robust consensus on the validity of using plate tectonic boundary process to decipher the late Archean rock record. And it also confirm, confirms that such process dominated the early Archean. So basically when he, what he appeals to, and he says, we are putting on trial this idea and we are the judges. And the verdict, the verdict is that we, the judges have a consensus. But the question is who are the judges? I mean, the judges are the ones from this school of thought. Okay, so of course they are in favor of this. So of course, if we, if we are the supporters of a football team, we agree with our football team, yeah? Of course, so of course there is a consensus, of course it's a robust. Now what he means by robust is that there are many people who think this in this community. Now, I have to remind you that when Galileo Galilei was put on trial because he was saying that the earth is rotating around the sun, there were many people who were not uh, in agreement with this idea. And they are thinking that the sun goes around the, the earth. So the fact that you have many people at some point in time thinking one thing doesn't mean that that thing is true. So in my opinion, such a statement cannot be used as proof <laughs> Yeah, that many people agree with this, so this is proof. Okay, let's look at the other paper. It says Archean magmatism and deformation were not products of plate tectonics. Wow, but this is the to to total opposite, total opposite. And look at what Warren Hamilton, the author of this paper says. He says, the distinctive array of petrological, petrologic, structural and stratigraphic features that characterize Panerozoic convergent plate systems, and you see which are all these elements, have no viable analogs in Archean terrains. Now, you might think now, from what you know, from what I've shown you last time, in terms of Archean geology, I've told you about high-grade gneisses, I told you about green stone belts, and I told you about the granitoids that invaded 
and that we don't even know if the greenstone belts were deposited on the hybrid gneisses. So if this is a archaean geology, Warren Hamilton comes and says, well, where are the elements that show me what we see today that are part of these orogenic systems? Obviously, we see deformation. We see it's very strong deformation. But what tells us that this deformation was through the rigid plate model? Yeah. Well, I think I'm I'm. Uh, yeah, I am uh, recording the class. It is recording. I, it's ten forty. So I don't know why it, uh, it appears to you as if I don't record it. So it, it is ongoing. Oh, OK. OK, Gabriel. So this being said, let's move on. So this sets the controversy, you see, very totally opposite uh, camps. And you might think, OK, uh, do I have, like uh, myself, a bias in this? I might. I mean, of course, I have my own ideas. And I may belong to one camp or to the other. Or I might sit on the fence. But we are assigned this. Even if we have a preference for uh, one camp, we have to, to give due consideration to the other camp as well. So um, I hope uh, that you know this will somehow go. Yeah, it will. All right, so let's look at in more detail the uniformitarian view. So what I do, I include some text from various papers so that you can read the abstracts, yeah, like the the summary of, of what these people say. And basically, when you look at this, uh, I'm, I'm showing you a paper from 2006 uh, by Peter Cowett. Yeah? And you see he's from Western Australia. And he says, Precambrian plate tectonics, criteria and evidence. So it sounds quite objective here. Yeah? But the abstract starts with a very strong statement. It says paleomagnetic, geochemical, and tectonostratigraphic data establish that plate tectonics has been active since at least 3.1 billion years. This is a very strong statement. And right away, you know in which camp this author is. And now you might think if Warren Hamilton here says exactly the opposite, he says the rock record shows us that there is no analog to plate tectonics in Archean. And then here comes Peter Cowden and says, oh, we look at paleomagnetic data, geochemical, tectonic stratigraphic, and we establish that plate tectonics has been active since at least 3.1 billion years or so. Now, now, the devil is in the details. <laughs> yes, he's going against Hamilton, definitely. The devil is in the details because how reliable are the paleomagnetic data? And the geochemical data, I'll tell you a bit about this. Anyway, so Peter Cowd, he's a scientist, so he has to give due process to his thinking. So basically, he says, OK, um, what can we invest, uh, envisage yeah, here? So he says he shows here three situations, three models from the normal uh, plate tectonic process from, uh, that we see today, like normal subduction you see here going to something that he calls shallow subduction and going to something called plume tectonics, plumes, yeah? So, so basically, he says that in Precambrian, you might have had all three of these situations, from normal sub subduction, similar to what we see today, to something which you see what he tells about the shallow subduction, to mantle plumes, yeah? And uh, he says, well, maybe in the past, and many authors say like this, Maybe it was more efficient for a lot of heat that existed in the past, a lot of heat production. The heat would be more easily removed by the mantle plumes. So basically, you would have a, a direction from the mantle core boundary to right to the lithosphere, and then we get rid of the heat. So maybe a lot of uh, plume activity happened in Archean and less plate tectonics. So some people are kind of saying, OK, maybe it wasn't like today. Maybe it was a combination, maybe with more um, uh, more uh, plume te uh, tectonics and, and things like this. So this is one view, all right? Now, here is another one. This is 2008 and says, what, when did plate tectonics begin? Evidence from the orogenic record. And here you, you, you have people from different parts of the world. As you can see, Sweden, Canada, 
Australia, South Africa. And they, they are recognized scientists nowadays, uh, some of them working with uh, geological surveys, as you can see, some with uh, universities. But they are quite famous, like John Percival is famous, Martin Van Cranendon is famous. They are all in the camp proposing and trying to apply the model of plate tectonics to the archaeal. So basically what they say, this is the abstract. You remember the Pilbara crater, Pilbara. You've sh you, I, I've shown you in Australia with those domes, granitic domes, and in between with vertical structures, these initially flat layers of basalt. And the idea of vertical tectonics, you remember, I've shown you this time, last time, satellite image, uh, a geologic map. So obviously a terrain that looks totally different, totally different from what we see today. And these people have this statement. They say, the Pilbara Craton preserves geological, geochemical, and geochronological evidence from continent for continental rifting at 3.2, development of an oceanic earth subduction complex at 3.12, and terrain accretion at 3.07. Then they go to the Capval. They say, well, we have evidence for high pressure, low temperature metamorphosis. And then they go to the Superior Province in the Canadian Shield, which, by the way, is probably providing the strongest argument, maybe, in favor of plate tectonics in the Archean time. I'll show you the Superior Province. But for someone who is not a, a geoscientist, who is not a specialist in this, when someone comes and says, wow, in Pilbara, it's very easy. We can see exactly the elements of plate tectonics that you see today. They will think, yeah, well, if they say, well, it's like this. And the question is, on what basis? Now, I don't want to, you to think that I want to, to uh, force into you one school of thought or not. not. Not at all. I want you to be the judges, to become scientists. You will make your own, up your own mind. But the science of geology is based on observation. And there is a certain limit to which you can extrapolate the observations. The geochemistry that they use so much. Think about this. People take a basalt formed in a, an island arc today, let's say in the Mariana arc. They take a basalt and analyze the chemistry. And they look at, it has so much magnesium, so much uh, iron, so much oxygen, all the elements, they do this analysis. And they say, they take another basalt from, from another island dark and, and they do the analysis. And they end up with a certain spectrum of chemical composition for the basalts associated with island arc magnetism where we con consider that we have uh, plate tectonics operating today. Then they go to the Archean and they take a, a basalt and they do the chemical analysis. Now, we, when we talk about basalt, obviously we talk more or less about the same chemical composition, no matter what, where it is formed. There are some specific things associated with island arcs and so on, but they take one from the Archean and they see some similarity, but there is by no way something exactly totally equal to what we see today. They see some similarity. They say, oh yeah, well, it's not that far. Oh, definitely it must have been an island arc in the Archean and the subduction zone. But nature could generate volcanism and, and the same chemical elements existed in the Archean. So obviously they have combined and they, they express themselves and they use this very weak geochemical thinking. And based on this, they infer mechanical thinking. Well, personally, I'm not a fan of, this, of these things. I once went to a conference uh, and I flew to, to Winnipeg from Toronto and I had to take uh, some car to get two hours away to a town called Kenora, uh, where the conference was. And it, I just met in the airport this lady from the Geological Survey of Canada, and she was renting a car. So of course we went together, and she's one of these very strong supporters of this 
school of thought because of the Geological Survey of Canada, they have this, they have this program. They decided to demonstrate before looking at the rocks that plate tectonics operated in the Archean. And then they go in the field and try to find the evidence so that it fits the model. Well, come on, what is this? So I was talking to her because I was looking at the rocks there in Western Superior and she kept talking and talking for two hours, telling me how geochemically those rocks are like this, those rocks are like that. And she was giving tectonic significance to these rocks. And I was like, I was just seeing that I, I was, I couldn't believe I was looking at those rocks and all I'm say, seeing is a schist. For God's sake, it's a schist. It's a green schist. And you are telling me all these very sophisticated tectonic scenarios and you are so certain that this is what it is. How come? How can you do this? And then they go and write these things in in such <laughs> yes, landed, in such a, a very uh, you know uh, um, decisive way with this kind of uh, narrative. So these people, at least, they they were reasonable. They offered, as you can see in this paper, an evolution, as you can see from plume tectonics to plate tectonics, an evolution in time coming from 3.8 to 2.8, as you can see. So we can look at this, and at least this is a proposal where they say, well, we admit that the rocks that are very old do not show us the evidence for plate tectonics. Maybe the younger ones, but still in the Archeans, they do. So here, here, uh, you can see one way of thinking, and I think it's maybe more reasonable and people can dispute and say, well, I'm not, I do not agree that at 3.2 so old in time, we, we have plate tectonics as we see them today, maybe in a modified version. So you will have a, a spectrum yeah, of people who think because it's so hard to interpret when you don't have the evidence. So I'm going to argue, we are still with uniformitarian views, I'm going to argue what is in favor of this. And I said to you earlier that the strongest argument that people bring is the superior province of the North American Craton. So these are the Great Lakes. Yeah, this is Lake Superior here, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, as you see. And this is the Archean Age superior province. And we have a lot of greenstone belts. These are greenstone belts. So greenstone belts means you get a green schist. And these are high grade gneiss terrains like Minto here and here um, and uh, here. These are uh, high grade gneisses. Then what you see here, there are some regions like Barents here, for instance. They are basically what's called metaplutonic terrains. Basically, there are regions with gneisses and plutons metamorphosed. And you don't see the green stones, you don't see the green schists. And what's very interesting in between here, you have two belts, uh, the, actually three, one is here, but they are called metasedimentary rocks. What they are, nowadays, if you go and look at the rock, it's a paragnice, it's a gneiss. It's a gray gneiss, but the original rock was a sedimentary rock, like a sandstone or a gray wacky. And what happens, it was metamorphosed so strongly, it's a gneiss, but it has uh, geochemically and mineralogically the evidence that initially the rock was a sedimentary rock. Because you see this belt, elong elongated belts, yeah, you see these belts, the, the metasedimentary belts elongated, metaplutonic belts elongated, and these belts of um, granite greenstones. Yeah? The interpretation was that we are looking at the, at the successive accretion of new micro terrains, micro continents and island arcs to a continental core here to the north. 
And basically the superior province shows us the evidence for accretionary processes in towards the end of the Archean time. So as you can see, if you look, uh, Paul Hoffman has been a, a very famous scientist and he was a pioneer of this model of plate tectonics in the Archean um, age superior province. And he published, he is very well respected. He published his papers. And as you can see, when he puts the color black in the legend here, he says, island arc supracrustal belt. And when he puts this pattern, he says, island arc plutons, like here. And then he says, when he looks at something like Barents, he says, continental arc batholith. As you can see, this is not a geologic legend. It doesn't tell you what rocks you are looking at. It doesn't tell you, well, guys, this is a green schist, and this is a tonalite, and this is a paragnize. No, he gives a tectonic interpretation to the rocks that we see today. And he says, well, these basalts that were transformed into green schists were formed in an island arc. But believe me, you are not going to see that when you go in the field. There is nothing to show you because you're not going to see volcanoes and so on. there is no topography initial topography from that time so basically there is a big jump from the rock that you see to something that you assume that it was a tectonic setting and i i'm stressing and I'm giving you this class because i want you to be good scientists i want you to be the best scientist if possible so i want you to go and say what do you see there I see this. And do you see the other thing? Well, no. Well, how do you know this? Well, this is the logic. How certain are you that this is the case? And here is where the problem starts. Yeah. So it's very easy when you present something like this. It looks so neat, so clean, so nice. And you, you, you tell a story. I'm not saying these rocks must have formed in a tectonic environment. I'm not saying there was a tectonic environment. I'm just saying, well, it's not very clear what the tectonic environment was. Now, I was saying that this is the strongest argument because of these elongated belts. And because of these elongated belts, it suggests the idea that we had a margin, yeah? And we had the formation of new terrains at that margin and the addition because there is some progression in time. So basically, theoretically, you would say, well, you have in time younger and younger rocks like this. It is so and so, it's a mixture. Actually, I did my uh, PhD over this Western part of the Superior. And uh, actually the oldest rock dated from the Superior province was dated by one of my colleagues, an American here from the Winnipeg River. And it was, it was a gneiss dated down to 3.3 billion years. Um, what happens is these people like uh, Paul Hoffman were suggesting and the Geological uh, Survey of Canada that these sedimentary belts were accretionary priests. Accretionary priests. We have no blue schist here. There is no evidence for high pressure, low temperature. It's only high temperature. It is a granulite grade paragnes. And they were saying these are very thick blocks of metasedimentary rocks, 20 kilometers thick. And I did a gravity survey and I looked at the data and I, I could not see this thickness. They are actually thin. And I basically suggested that to me, they look like synorogenic sedimentary deposits that form on the, on the flanks of orogenic belts. But I cannot say that they are a Christian or a priest. I, I, I don't have the evidence for this. I only can say that it was definitely a sedimentary basin. Yes. So that's the idea. So there is a controversy here. Yeah. But this is, believe me, what they consider to be the strongest argument. Now, this is what Paul Hoffman explains. And you can see his inter tectonic interpretation of these terrains. All right, it makes for a very good story in a sense. 
And this is basically a scenario of these subsequent subduction zones and the accretion that happened to the north of these various trains. Yeah, so it, he explains this here. So you can read this. Um, I'm not saying that necessarily everything is wrong. I, I'm just saying that I am a bit, um, how to put it, careful in terms of the inter interpretation. I don't want to teach you and say, this is what it was. This is what they think it was. Okay, now, another strong argument, again, coming from the Spira province, was published in 1995 by Andrew Calvert. He's a seismologist, and basically, the, uh, in Canada, you had this uh, money, uh, public money put into investigating the crust of the uh, superior province and other parts of the Creton. So there was a seismic line uh, done here at the, uh, at the boundary between uh, the Abitibi uh, belt and the uh, Opatka belt here. And what they saw, Basically, they saw this. This is a radiography of the superior province crust. And you see very nicely the moho here. Yeah. So where you see this reflectivity ending, that's the boundary between the crust and the mantle. And in general, the mantle is featureless in the seismic reflection records. Now, there is a big discussion about what the reflectivity in the crust means, because when we look at sedimentary basins, we can see the layers, but in the crust, no one knows. No one can go there and no one knows what creates the re re reflectivity. So there are a lot of hypotheses related to gneisses and the gneissic bending and separation into uh, felsic, uh, light color layers and mafic layers and so on. So as obviously you can see that we have regions that are more transparent. And the question is, in the more transparent regions, do we have plutons? Do we have big baffolites? Because the granitic rocks tend to be more homogeneous, so maybe less opportunity for reflections. So this is one thing. Obviously, we can see a fabric of kind of these reflectors dipping towards north. So obviously, this tells us something that probably structurally speaking, we have a certain structural fabric that is basically uh, correlated with these uh, seismic reflectors towards the north. So obviously the deformation happened. There was compression coming and creating this fabric. And Andrew Calvert, the interpretation of this band of reflectors extending down into the mantle, the interpretation was that we are looking at an Archean age relict subduction zone and this is basically a remnant of the subducted plate. So this was something that was, that's why if you look at the journal here, the journal is nature. Now, uh, it's not that everyone can publish in, in nature or in, uh, in, um, in science. Science is the American journal, nature is the British journal. Nature is considered very high standard. If you publish in nature, you are considered, wow, uh, but nature has one catch. They want you to bring something really new, something that is, that, you know, it's like news, like no one has seen that until then. And that's why this was published and accept, accepted and published by nature, because these people come and say, well, now we can settle the matter. These are the arguments. We can see the subduction zone. We can see the subducted plate. This is the interpretation of what we are seeing here which might be the case, I don't know. If you ask me, I would say, well, I don't know. It might be the case, but all that we are seeing is a region of re reflectivity extending into the upper mantle. So it can be in the same way, what is a subduction zone? It can be a shear zone. Yeah, it can be a zone of, of lithospheric scale uh, folding, I don't know what it is. No one can for sure say that this is a relict subduction zone, but because we have a model that we like, we say, well, obviously this is what it is, yeah? So I'd say might be, might be a good evidence, but 
will always put a, a bit of a question mark on it because we have some alternatives as well. So I'm giving you what is the strongest evidence so far. And uh, finally, this is, as you can see, 2006. This is the group from the Geological Survey of Canada. And this group has published uh, using the lithoprobe seismic investigation of the Superior Province, published this uh, synthesis paper with the tectonic evol evolution of the Western Superior Province. And uh, the group contains uh, various people, uh, different specialists. Uh, this last one is a seismologist, the, the person who was interpreting. I talked to Don White and I had some controversy with him because what happens is they give a certain interpretation to one feature that they see at the base of the crust. And I say, well, but you have alternatives. It could be this, what you say, but it could be that or that or that. And he would say, no, but it, it's this. <laughs> All right, but why? I mean, why only this, okay? Because you like it. You like this interpretation. So this is where you have the uh, seismic lines, for instance, but I'm gonna show you the seismic line going like this. And they have both the refraction and the reflection. So as an information on, on the craton is great. So basically what you see here is a combination of reflection data. So you see the reflectors here. And in color is the result of refraction data, which gives you an information of the velocity of the waves. So you can see the seismic velocity of the different layers of the crust down to, uh, down to the moho here. And the controversy that I have had with Don White and with all these uh, people uh, is related to this red layer, which is a high velocity layer at the base of the crust, as you can see here, coming from the south to the north. And they have interpreted it, this is their inter interpretation, as a subcreated oceanic crust. So as a, as a piece of oceanic lithosphere that was subducted in shallow subduction, and it is subcreated here. Uh, subcreated means accreted under the, uh, the crust. And this is their interpretation with two subduction zones, two sutures. So they call these sutures. You see suture one, suture two. Now, when I told you about sutures, when we talked about origins, I said, well, we must have some evidence of this oceanic lithosphere preserved pieces of it like slivers in terms of ophiolite. You will not find this in the Archean rock record. So they do this interpretation, which I say, okay, that's fine. It is an interpretation and everyone has the right to do an interpretation as long as it is reasonable. But why not accept alternative interpretations? Why not accept that what you what you see as a high velocity layer, dense layer, could be, for instance, a region that suffered underplating of mafic magmas from a big rifting event, which is right here to the south, which happened at 1.1 billion years old, which is called the mid-continent rift, and which almost split the continent. We almost had an oceanic, a new oceanic basin formed, and this event was so, so the magnitude of this event was so big with packages of 15 kilometers of lavas uh, that it, to me, it makes a lot of sense that you would have intrusion of magma into the surrounding crust. So this could be an alternative. I'm not saying that this is a true, but just because you want to, uh, to um, suggest that the, you want to, to show that this model applies to the Archean terrains, you force an interpretation. So this is what these people do. They are in this camp, okay? Now, um, finally, uh, in this camp, I put uh, Condi here and Kroner, and you see 2008, uh, and they basically, they try to answer the question, when did plate tectonics begin? And 
they come with the idea that plate tectonics uh, existed by three billion years ago uh, were operational and widespread by 2.7. Uh, but at least these people modulate modulate their idea and they say it is unlikely that plate tectonics began on, on earth as a single global event at a distinct time but rather it is probable that it began locally and progressively became more widespread from the early to the late Archean. so i'd say that they these are very reasonable people that they, they say well not suddenly someone switched a switch and suddenly we have plate tectonics all over the planet maybe it's a process initiated somewhere we had different tectonics in other parts and because the conditions became such in terms of uh, you know the change in the balance of heat loss and heat production and so on more and more this process took over so they are more reasonable in this thing in, in my opinion so the verdict they give is a bit kind of qualified and I would uh, basically say well this is uh, you know what what uh, would at least satisfy the observations of absence of some elements in some parts and maybe presence of elements of plate tectonics in other parts all right so I'm ending these views with a positive note I'm not dismissing them completely I'm just saying that we have to be reasonable and be certain in what we say now Let's go to Warren Hamilton and non-uniformitarian views. Um, Warren Hamilton, he was um, a very famous, very famous American geologist. Um, and um, I'll tell you a bit more about him, but he published papers, very strong papers and very informed of a, a truly uh, amazing scientist. And basically he would say, uh, that the magmatic and tectonic process in the Archean yeah, or the young earth differed profoundly from those of the modern past. Uh, the, the ancient rocks differ strikingly in the individual and collective composition, occurrence, association, and structure from modern uh, rocks. And here in blue is something that really I like. He says, widespread forcing of Archean geology into plate tectonic frameworks reflects reflects unwarranted faith in uniformitarianism and in inappropriate chemical discriminants and disregard for the lack of features that characterize plate interactions. So when he says about inappropriate chemical discriminants, it's what I was mentioning to you before about ge geochemical similarities. So what he's arguing in his works is that the crust was way more soft in and the lithosphere were more soft than at the present because of the heat and because of this it would be too weak and too mobile the lithosphere to behave as a rigid plates so basically you would have pieces that would form but would would not be able to sustain things like subduction and things like this so He's bringing a lot of arguments. His papers are just a delight to read, actually. Um, he had the strength to basically oppose or, or take, take the hits from many other scientists who, for different reasons, I, I'll give you a reason. Nowadays, it, and it's a social reason, it's not a scientific reason. If you go as a university professor in a good university, let's say you go to Stanford or you go to whatever uh, you can go to um, England or it's good that you have if you have uh, opinions which are more or less in agreement with the opinions of the majority because if you try to grain to to swim against the grain and have totally different opinions you might not advance you might not be published and that means you lose your employment and so on so there are social pressures on the young scientists and instead of them being independent thinkers they go along the flow <laughs> and and that's why we end up with these situations but warren hamilton had nothing to lose and when he was publishing his papers he was a con consecrated scientist so he had nothing to lose and he took his time to try to show 
uh, his arguments in great detail. Now, the reason I, I like him is because what he's saying that he's seeing in the Archean rocks is what I was seeing in the Archean rocks. And I was saying, well, this is someone who tells me that he sees the same thing that I see. And he's not inventing things that I cannot see there. Yeah, so that's the idea. Anyway, he gives here uh, an idea of these vertical tectonics that we, we talked about. He says about the dense lavas that erupted the top mobile felsic crust. Yeah, and you have the density inversion that led to the sinking and the formation of the greenstone belts and the rising of the tonalite, tongemite, granodiorite suites. Yeah, so that he talks about this. And then he says, well, rifting, separation, rotation, collision of more rigid lithosphere began at 2.1 billion years. Yeah, so basically he sees a process of transition to plate tectonics, and he recognizes that in, in Proterozoic, you do have elements of plate tectonics. So he's not that different from what Condi said in the last paper I was showing you in the uniformitarian views. And Condi was saying, well, maybe we have some plate tectonics in at three billion years, but not widespread. So he and Hamilton, at least, they come from different camps, but still they have the common ground. It's just a matter, okay, in terms of dates, but here is something that makes sense. So that's where people can say, well, instead of being rigid and uh, impose a strict rigid concept, we can actually see that, uh, you know, there is reason in what we observe. All right. So um, here is uh, another scientist, you see, uh, Robert Stern. And he says very clearly, modern style plate tectonics began in neoproterozoic time. And he offers an alternative interpretation. And there are many other authors that offer, I just show you a few of them. He says, the modern episode of plate tectonics began uh, at less than 1 billion years ago. Yeah, with earlier alternating episodes of protoplate tectonics. So alternating means there was something maybe similar, not that widespread. So again, he tries to say what Hamilton says, and again, what Condi says in a certain way. He offers this model of lead, lead tectonics and stagnant lead with periods where you, you have a carapace, like a lead, uh, which is not mobile, and periods where, where you have mobility. And he has some, some evolution for the planet in terms of tectonics from an initial convecting magma ocean with little, little rock bergs, he calls them, yeah. And then he says, you see, in the Archean uh, period, he says, either you might have had some protoplate tectonics, so some incipient, again, as Condi said, or you might have something he calls unstable stagnant lead. So this vertical tectonic modulated by mantle plume tectonics. So this would be the way the planet was basically uh, losing heat. And then this would lead to modern style plate tectonics. And in the future, he says, the future is bleak. We will have the final supercontinent he calls Ultimea, and we will have a stable stagnant lead in the distant future like other planets. So basically he offers a model based on the rock record that we see and based on the thinking, mechanical thinking, thermomechanical thinking, he says this is going to be the evolution. So quite a nice scientist in my opinion. All right, so this being said, I just uh, want you to uh, read a bit about Warren Hamilton. That's why I said that uh, a bit uh, later. So this is uh, my last slide, um, or second to last, as a memorial to him. So what I want you to, if you are interested, go to this site and you can download some of his uh, uh, papers. Very interesting, really very interesting papers he was uh, writing. Uh, basically, he says, uh, as you can see, that the geologic record of the young earth differs from that of the modern one. And he says, our goal should be to understand 
the process. But most geoscientists who study ancient complexes are imbued with dogmatic uniformitarians. And I wanted to, to give you this lecture because I want you to avoid dogmatic uniformitarians. I want you to be very good scientists. Okay, so this is my, um, my memorial to Warren Hamilton. And um, finally, I want you to read this article from the, um, the Encyclopedia of Solid Earth Geophysics um, on Precambrian plate tectonics. Generally, they favor the idea of plate tectonics uh, initiating in the Archean, but they give a very bal balanced view and they show a colored version of the stern uh, model. Okay, so this is it for today. Uh, this is it in terms of the um, Precambrian, Precambrian tectonics. And um, if you have questions, please don't be shy. If not, have a great, um, great uh, afternoon, uh, great uh, fin de semana, and uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. All right. So thank you very much. Teacher out of class, which uh, type of movement are you part of or which one is the one that you believe not not trying to influence us or anything but just which one personally is the one that you believe the most yes personally uh, every person can be biased yeah so personally i tend to agree with warren hamilton and with stern and uh, there are other scientists i don't truly think that the archean rock record which is so different from the rest of the rock record I don't don't think that we can have a strong argument that we have the typical present day uh, plate tectonics. What happens is the strong record allows us to 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 see the vertical tectonics. We see them in these greenstone belts and so on. Um, and I can say I cannot say more than that. We might have had some incipient. Uh, we might have had mantle plumes, um, but I, I don't see the evidence for the type of plate tectonics that we see today. So I tend to be on the uh, non-uniformitarian uh, side. Yeah. So this is uh, my personal approach. But I, I, this doesn't mean that I would not listen to someone who tries to bring me arguments. Because if an argument is valid, it's valid, yeah? So if you have something, but if I think that it's just an, an imagination, then I can say, well, I cannot make this connection. Yeah, so that's the idea. <laughs> David. Perfect teacher, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You are welcome, all of you. Right. Thank you, Maria, Valentina, Juan. Thank you, teacher. I just Thank wanted you, to say that it was Thank a really interesting you. class. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm glad you, you liked it. Uh, I, I'm uh, very happy that you could participate in the uh, classes, and uh, I hope you are doing well. Yeah, teacher. Thank you so much, and please have welcome. a good weekend. You are welcome. You too, David. Bye. Thank you.